I've got some questions that I, I always write down when we don't have somebody on in particular. Uh, and one of the questions that came up was changes. How do you teach your team to change in terms of the uh, shift length and then managing the door? And what's a good change? What's a bad change? Uh, that's sort of where I wanted to start with. And I also wanted to mention that next week, Jeff Richards, who's a Hockey Canada goalie coach, uh, primarily on the, uh, I'm not sure, male side, uh, he's going to be a guest. And he sent me an email, uh, and I had questions for him about, you know, short-term competition. How do you determine number one? Is it 1A, 1B? And the nuances of the... Uh, I've had peewee coaches who alternated goalies all year and in the playoffs picked one and they didn't get their job back. <laughs> but that's going to be the nature of uh, next week's session. So my question, throwing it out to everybody, and welcome, Rick, to the group, is uh, how do you teach changes? and uh, Or do you teach changes? Because it came up with, uh, an issue I had last week at a game <clears throat> where the the coach, for the first time, had initiated a strategy to hold the player back so he didn't go on the ice and get too many men on the ice when the puck was in the area. And he got really upset when the player uh, didn't do it. And I ended up talking to Tim and different people about it. But let's talk about changes. Any questions? What's an ideal shift length? At what point uh, at different age levels do you teach? And hell, I'll throw it out to you. What's, what's your deal on shift lengths? <clears throat> well... We, we actually have this Bantam team, and we've got 20 kids on the team. So we've got four lines, and the games are only 15 minutes long, 15-minute periods. And we've had conversations about, and most of the competition only has two lines. And, you know, clearly it's a problem for us because their best players end up playing against our weaker players as we rotate through. So the shift length would be ideally 45, 50 seconds. We, uh, when we were up in War Road, we had a, uh, we had a couple of these characters on the team decided to skate a two and a half minute shift. <laughs> and, um, although their center came off, they just stayed. And they would not come off the ice. And so we had to uh, intervention for, for a couple cycles through that. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, one of the other changes that I've made this year is the kids have to sit on the bench. They can't hang over the boards and lean. And coaches, most of the teams down here now, the kids hang over the boards and the coaches walk on the bench because they can't see otherwise. But you also can't talk to the kids because you're now way up above them. Um, so we did that and then they weren't paying attention. So when players were coming off, they're sitting there because they've been sitting there for three or four minutes. Uh, so we have the next line up, st they stand up. The rest of the kids are dying. Um, and then we kind of got away from that. And then all of a sudden, kids are coming off and nobody's going on. So I, I don't know. You just have to you know, shift length. If the kids are in shape, they ought to be able to skate a minute, a minute, and a quarter. Um, but if you're only running two lines, they get, they get tired, they'll come off. If you're running four lines, they, they get tired, but then they sit for a long time. So we're, I'm sort of struggling with how to how to manage this um, 
So any thoughts any of you guys have, I appreciate it. Well, I'm going to bring up a, another issue that I found out last night. Uh, Jordan ran a practice for and with Tom, he, uh, Wes's team. So he had the midget girls uh, running his practice with <clears throat> Wes's team. Wes was on the ice, and we talked about everything that went on. And after the practice, Wes brought up some of the issues that he's encountered where his son had played for a coach who's wanted 20 second shifts <laughs> and his philosophy was high tempo <laughs> and uh, he was you know adamant about it and of course we laugh about that because you know, the, the players got paranoid they were looking at the clock all the time they didn't want to get over 20 because he would yell at them <clears throat> when they came back to the bench over 20. So that's an extreme. But here's a minor hockey coach doing that. And uh, you had mentioned, Hal, the one group staying out, uh, one center staying out longer than two minutes. And I, I feel that shift length is a cardinal coaching issue. And if you don't establish a 40 to 50 second shift length, uh, one minute is sort of the line of max, uh, mm -hmm. and you don't reinforce it. And the question is reinforcing it. And what, what I'm saying is consistently, you're aware that disrupts the rotation. It, well, it's not good for the team. It's a selfish uh, thing to do. So, the st you know, I'm very objective on this, Hal. And you must communicate it at the beginning of the year that there are three or four Cardinals that will be addressed immediately with everybody, and the consequences are the same. So my uh, habitual way of dealing with it is, number one, you get talked to, reminded of what we talked about at the beginning of the year and an explanation of why possibly from the person that you talk to that you're asking because uh, they're the one that you've already told them why the second step it happens is set a shift and the third time a period now, if you have a fourth time uh, with all these things I call Cardinals, I, I would have them sit a game, keep stats, come down between periods, still be engaged, but you've got a serious problem if you have mm -hmm. to go to that level. And that's when the parents are aware of this because they were part of the initial communication before you started the season. And if it's so we, managed, we managed to get through that, um, I think as you know, in my, as a coach, I'm there are some times where where you, I mean, I think depending on the flow of the game a little bit, when you get a line that's playing really well. I might give them a little a little more time, and if they're struggling, their shift might be 20 seconds, and I'm going to take them off and put it put the next group out. Because sometimes you know, not everybody plays a great shift every every time they go out, <clears throat> and you know and if they're if they're not uh, if they're not winning faceoffs and they're you know and they have two or three of them in our zone and they keep losing the faceoff, I'm going to put five new kids out there because they know that we need to win faceoffs and we have a system, but a couple of them don't want to do it, so we take them off. We put kids out there that'll do it, um, and I think I've communicated in the past several weeks. We've got some kids that are real problematic on this team, and um, we had three or four, and we've got one's going for. Uh, well, it was he was up for a five-game suspension, and his mother decided to appeal it, 
So that'll take a couple of weeks for that process. And while the appeal goes on, he gets to play. Well, he gets to be on the team, but I'm going to cut his ice time about 90% and just let him sit there because she can't, she can't tell me I can't bench her kid. And I mean, these are just things that you shouldn't really have to deal. With. I've never had this number of things to deal with. And, you know, and it's older kids picking on younger kids and they just don't seem to get the message. So the hammer's coming down. Started yesterday. And even yesterday, one of the kids went and picked on one of the younger kids. Said he ratted out the, the kid that was the problem that's going. And it's like, I don't know, see, what do you, you know. So we're going to the show up and shut up <coughs> methodology. He's got to quit talking. And, um, but you're right. Uh, Wally, it's uh, it's something you have to really manage, and, uh, and then we've had conversations ongoing with the players about why why do we want forty five second shifts? And they notice even in the game, we lost a game the other night. We were down four to nothing five minutes into the game and lost the game um, by four, but. Um, I said, why do why do why do we want short shifts? And they go, well, because and we can play hard when we're out there. Cool. How many lines were they playing? Two. Did you notice what happened as the game goes on? Their two lines got slower and slower and slower, and we got faster and faster and faster. Yeah, we notice that. So it's it's a learning process. I hope. Uh, we'll see what happens on Saturday. <laughs> you know, they're 14. They don't remember much. <laughs> Tim Bothwell. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, just in my experience, I've always found that a little, like from a player's perspective, I, I, I had more success not giving a warning, sitting a shift and then extending it, but giving two warnings, like, Sometimes behavior, it's hard to change in the moment, but so they, they get a warning. And if it happens a second time, I'm like, okay, last warning, we got to see a change. And I, I found over the years that I, I think the players appreciate that and react better to it. And they're, they're, it's, it's been more effective for me in actually creating a change in behavior um, especially in younger kids, um, you know, yeah. sometimes, yes, as we all know, you have to hit the hammer a whole bunch of times to get the nail in. Um, so yeah. that just, I mean, it's not that different than what Wally uh, had just said, but I, I've had more success, like sort of warning, warning, then sit a shift or even two and then oh. back out. And then if there's still a problem, then of course, you know, like Wally says, you've, you know, you got to set them by extended period or period or whatever it is, half a period. But anyway, this is my two cents. I want to share a, a true story here this year. <clears throat> uh, I don't worry about coaches and X's and O's and uh, mentoring and trying to talk about D zone and four check and power play. You know, we all can have our own ideas about that. But these behavioral things shift length, if you don't deal with it consistently, uh, in other words, you deal with one kid, he sets a period because this coach's rule is if you take a, a violent penalty, you set a period. And then he has another player that has an addressable issue that in the second or third time he's done it, nothing happens. So that inconsistency, that's when I would approach, if I'm working with the association or the coach, that's a cardinal. It's called behavioral coaching. And I, I did phone the assistant coach who I knew very well. And he said he would have a conversation with the head coach about it. And I, I really reiterated that this was one of the root problems the team was having. 
is coaching inconsistency and the respect that's lost when you do that. And it improved significantly after that. So I'm going to leave it at that uh, in terms of that issue. And I wonder if Rick has anything to say from his years experience dealing with with shift like Rick, are you still with us? Yeah, I'm still here, Wally. Thank okay. you. My apologies, my camera doesn't seem to want to perform tonight, this morning, so I might have to bench it for a while here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, as far as, as uh, talking to the players, yes, we do uh, always have uh, dealt with them uh, verbally, um, off ice and on ice about uh, shift changes and paying attention, being alert to what's going on in the game from the moment that the puck drops till the time the final buzzer goes. Um, as far as uh, shift length, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, you get the response from the players when you challenge them on it that, well, I'm not tired. Why would I come off? So I've actually uh, run some 45 second drills, no puck drills, where I put uh, a unit of five on the ice and they go back and forth for 45 seconds on the clock blow the whistle, do a line change over the boards, through the gate, off, and we run that through uh, three or four or five, six cycles. And then I tell them, this is how you feel when you've had a good 45 second shift. If you don't feel this way after 45 seconds, thereabouts, you're not working hard enough. Now, use that as your, as your benchmark. And I've had good success with that. Morning, Sammy. You know, just a couple couple of thoughts there. Like one one of the things I always try to impress on on my teams, because you like Rick says, you you hear that a lot. Well, I'm not tired. Like, why should I get off? Well, the, then the question back to them is, well, do you want to be out there when you're tired, like in in your D zone or whatever? Well, no, I don't. I don't want to be out there when I'm tired. I I get off then. Well, you know what? You don't control when you get off all the time. So the idea is to change before you get tired. If you wait till you're tired, that's too late because then you could be, you know, facing a, a back check where, where you need that energy and or, you know, you're stuck in your D zone and now you can't get it out and it all goes downhill. But I, I was on the, on the lighter side. The other way to deal with uh, uh, monitoring line changes is you could find a really tough kid uh, I think it was Tiger Williams told me this story, but you know I think he was playing in Vancouver and he he was up next on the next line and I think it was Pavel Bure was out ahead of him and the center came off and uh, I don't I can't remember Tiger's left wing the center came off the right wingers off and Bure stayed out there for like another thirty seconds forty seconds forty five and when he came to the bench to come off Tiger was standing in the door and he said. Get back out there and stay there. And Burray just took off again, and he's got stuck out for like two minutes. He said he saw that solved the problem. <laughs> but you have to be Tiger Williams or find one. I, I want to relate a story to a U15 a girl who's <clears throat> I'm breaking down video over shifts, talking to her just to see if she's going to learn visually from these things, and consistently. She's attacking the defenseman one on three or making a pass in the neutral zone late in a shift. So I've seen her in two sh clips late in the shift where she got beat and then came off versus oh. dump dumping it in and changing. And it's not that the coach is advocating possession changes and that kind of thing. They're not at that level, but she's doing this consistently. And I brought it up and it, it's still happening. So is that an, a, a hockey sense thing? Are they so wired into the game and doing it themselves that they don't think of shift length? And Tom at you know the girl I'm talking about. I'm beginning to think that this time spent uh, discussing exactly that scenario is a waste of time. And that's fine. 
it's something that some kids just aren't open to learning from it. Uh, and it's not like they stayed out too long at all. It's just that little nuance within the end of a shift of knowing it's time to dump it, not pass it, and turn it over ahead of the blue line because you, you're outnumbered. So, Tom, any thoughts on that? Mute. Yeah, it's, well, shift length is really critical. I'll tell you, the first time when I was coaching with Willie at University of Calgary, we were in Toronto in the Nationals, and we're leading by two goals with two minutes left. And uh, we had these two guys we called Medicine Hat Fats because neither one of them were in great shape. So, Anyways, one guy stayed out, and, and the, the winger by the bench, they changed like two or three times, and he stayed out there. He's so tired. He tried to sit on the puck to kill the play, and they knocked it out of there, and they went down, and they shot, and they scored, and uh, that was 152 left, and then uh, they scored another one a little while after that. They all got all fired up, and then they beat us in overtime. And if he would have come off, you know, like he should have, I'm sure we would have um, gone on there. So that's the kind of thing that happens. La last game the other night, we got a penalty for too many men on the ice. And the parent that was opening the door let the player out a little early. I didn't really see it, but Jim was, didn't agree with it. But I don't know. I, I just talk to players if they're, if they're going too long and, you know, it. I haven't had a real problem with it. I've but, got a, a humorous story related to that, Tom. When you said he sat on the puck and that's the only way he could change to get a whistle. Uh, when I coached the uh, Japanese women in Nagano against the U.S. and Canada, we couldn't get out of our zone in the, in the game. And the, after the first game against Canada, I practiced the next day of swarming the puck and falling on it to get a whistle when the puck was in our zone. Literally practice it at practice. So practical necessity just so we could get off the ice because I remember looking over the boards. I was thinking we were shorthanded. I looked over the boards and this young lady was crawling on the ice trying to get to the bench. So, you know, that's that's another extreme, but, uh, you know, I've, we've talked about Sammy shift length because um, last night one of the coaches mentioned his son was playing for a coach who had 20-second shifts because he wanted a higher tempo, and he yelled at them if they were out longer than that. And, of course, the players were not happy because they got paranoid about it, and they weren't happy because he yelled at them. So, um, Sammy, at your age, isn't there a buzzer that goes and they have to change at your level? Everybody yeah, I mean, not for 46-year-olds, but um, for my <laughs> seven-year-old, there, there is a buzzer. Um, it actually, we got it changed for our organization because at the start of the year, it was a minute. And I thought that was really quick. Like the kids, you know, they're just getting six and seven year olds, they're just getting on the ice trying to figure out what even what to do out there. So um, we got it switched to a minute and a half. But I th I almost think that two minutes would be better at that level because you're, I mean, still out there as a coach picking up and kind of getting them in the right spots and stuff. So it's house league, but uh, at least we got it to a minute and a half. But it is nice. Um, with our U9 team, we just started to uh, play full ice for the uh, first time last weekend. So they do full ice so that the kids that are in women's hockey, because it's a two-year cohort, are going to be moving up next year. So they want them to understand offsides. And um, so what you guys discussed with Kim last week was so great for me because I could I taught the kids about train tracks and I taught them about sort of positions and positionless hockey. So that was really great. Um, some of the parents were a little bit confused, but I said, trust me, this is going to work in the long, in the long term. So... Um, Kim's kids uh, seem to pick it up a little bit quicker than mine did, but 
she's smarter than me, so. <laughs> yes, but shift length is uh, definitely a, a, an issue. It's interesting, Wally, because our Toronto Six team plays on the Olympic size ice. So I, I'm curious if on Olympic size ice, it um, becomes more difficult to maybe get off sometimes. I don't know if that's, I don't know if it's an issue with us, but I'm kind of curious. You guys have coached on Olympic ice. Yeah, I'm going to ask different. Tim. Tim, the, um, the nuances of the closest one changing and the other D, the far D, playing that position, uh, how do you coach that? Relative forwards, Andy. Well, you just—I mean, I don't—I don't think I've ever in my day practiced that. But you make it clear to them that that's just a given. That's a hockey sense thing. If uh, you don't have a chance to change both the D and you know, like for instance, if the if the right D decides to go to the bench and change, and you're still out there, then you take the right D and whoever comes on, you know, just to fill space more uh, equitably. That's just, that's a given. One of the things I noticed with the Danish girls is they wouldn't change by position. They, uh, you know, the center would come off and the person closest to the door would go out, whether it was the left winger, the right winger, the D would do it. I'm like, ladies, uh, we're all position, play, you know, because we're playing position hockey. Um, you know, the center comes off, the center goes on. Uh, and there's obviously a, a small reason for that. Like if there's, a, say, a, an icing call and your center has come off and your left wing has gone on, now you've got no center out there to take the face off in your own zone, which obviously can lead to trouble. But so those type of things are just things, uh, as, you, as they get older, you just, uh, you know, you have to talk to them about, but I've never really... Uh, Practice also, um, for the Toronto Six, when we play uh, three on three overtime hockey, they make us do the long change on purpose. So yeah, the girls I can't think that's get good. off. Yeah, I, I like it. It is. And uh, all the games that we've either won or lost have all been determined by players not getting off the ice, just gassed. I mean, and you can't get off the ice. So it certainly makes the game go quicker. That's for sure. Yeah. And we, we've talked about this before, Sammy. And you could talk to Geraldine's coaching with you, right? Correct. Yeah. She's the head coach. It, it happened totally by accident with us when I was working with Danielle at UFC. We got into overtime, same thing, and we switched ends, you know. So our bench is next to the offensive end. And we got, we won the faceoff, got possession. Now, you know, not much happened. We had possession for like 45, 50 seconds. Uh, and we got a full change in. And uh, Mount Royal still stuck out there. And then it happened again. And they're still stuck out. We got into our third change. And I'm like, I'm I'm waiting, you know, for somebody to really deliberately do that and set it up so your your three best players maybe start. Hey, you're not trying to score, you're trying to get it in, wear the other team out, change one at a time, get another group out there, do the same thing, again to get your best players out again. And maybe in the overtime on the third shift. But, uh, yeah, I, I like the long change in overtime. It adds a real element of excitement, I think. Mm -hmm. well, it certainly does. I mean, it, you could just see it just that first minute, everybody's go, go, go. But if you can't get off, then it just that next minute, somebody's going to score. Yeah. So you really yeah. need to be cognizant of getting, getting off too, right? And even sometimes changing three on three in your own zone as a defensive player makes more sense than just waiting it out. And it's an interesting kind of conundrum. Do I go, you know, I'm not contributing. So do I go off or yeah. So you've, I I've seen it at the junior level too, where that player just like takes off and somebody else comes on. Um, it'd be an interesting coaching maneuver. That's for sure. Uh, is that three on three o overtime, Sammy? Correct. Yeah, on the long change. Yeah, we talked about the nuances of <clears throat> three on three. Possession changes are imperative. In three but if you on don't have, I mean, not defensively. So if you don't have possession, you've yeah. been out for three minutes yeah. now. Do you change or do you stay? Like, what's. Well, I think you're locked in. You, you, yeah. <laughs> Pretty hard to change when the bench is at the other end. Like, it's tough. 
Like yeah, I've, it just I've, seems like that's when most goals go in. So. Oh yeah, I'm advocating the best drill in hockey when they can skate past. I'm not sure if it's U. Uh, I think U13 would be perfect. A three on three scrimmage with possession changes only. Practice it. Mm -hmm. Because now they're holding on to the puck and they know they're working on this tactical skill. So it's a very pivotal thing. And not only will it translate to better hockey awareness, uh, five on five, because the, the game of possession. People are advocating possession changes five on five. And like we said, uh, so it, 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 it is neat. Now, Sammy, you mentioned extending the shift at U9. I totally agree. Uh, in fact, I, I, as a rule, when I did coach, the first shift was long. I wanted them long. Very first shift for every line just to get them into the game. And so a minute to a minute and a half was acceptable. After that, it was less than a minute, 40, 45 to a minute, uh, because that it's that getting into the game, like Rick's idea of 45 second um, anaerobic drills, where you reach that point of fatigue, well, no shift is consistently that high tempo with enough return, you know, there's recovery time on the ice. So it's sort of the, the flexibility of how hard you work and if you're back, you know, how fatigued are you? And you read your body. And I, what bothers me uh, is players that at the end of the shift are rushing the puck and not dumping it. And that's happening. Rick? Your speaker, Rick. Got to get your speaker going, Rick. Got the camera working, lost the voice. <laughs> uh, yeah, just to, just to clarify on my uh, my comments earlier, the, the 45 second thing was to give them a benchmark as to that's what you feel like when it's done. Obviously, most shifts are not 30, 45 seconds. They're more like a minute and a minute and change. But it's just to give them some perspective on, on what the expectation should be from them, when to know to trigger, I need to get off before that happens. But it's all part of a conversation and a demonstration of, uh, of actual experience to, to give them the benefit that this is this is what you you should be working towards, and making the smart change obviously depending on puck position where the bench is and so on. Yeah, some some of our some of my my teams like at University of Vermont where they're early on where there was you know uh, less rather than more hockey sense in the group. We we actually scrimmaged occasionally, and we would you know whistle or toot the horn after 45 seconds and then it was up to them to judge um you know to try to change as soon as they could after that buzzer or you maybe you do it at 40 seconds and the whole idea was sort of the same thing rick is to give them a sort of a feel for what that shift length looks like so it's not always you know how fatigued you are not always your body, but you want to keep the rhythm of the game for your lines. You don't want to stay out too long. And, you know, um, especially for D, like sometimes you get out there and you're in the offensive zone for most of your shift. You're really in recovery mode. You're oftentimes not not moving that much. So we, we did that to give them kind of a, a kinesthetic, if that's the right word, feel for how long the 45 seconds is and uh, then you should start thinking about changing and for sure, you know, making a good change like on the offense as much as you can, because I'm, I've never been a change on the back check person. That's another discussion, but I've never liked it. See it all the time in the NHL. One thing I picked up at the Alberta hockey, uh, they have trainers on the on the bench. 
And uh, one coach that I was mentoring, one team, the trainer had a stopwatch and on the bench at the 45, uh, 40 second mark would talk loudly so everybody on the bench knew 40, 41, 42, 43. And I think that's the same as tooting the horn. So it's actually a, an awareness piece, a consciousness piece. The players on the bench get it. So when they go out, they're more sensitive to it. And uh, it's not like, uh, I don't know, Tom. Uh, I got the duck call, which I blew on the bench when a player didn't headman the puck. And headman the puck is a cardinal to me. If somebody's open ahead of you and you don't pass it, the rule is I'm talking to you because why? Why is that important? And it's obvious to all of us. The second time it happens, they sit a shift. It's a cardinal. And it's an attitudinal thing. So, uh, Tom, have you used your duck call on your bench? You said you use it. I haven't heard it, and I see it happening quite a bit, but those kids are pretty young, so I don't know whether you would use it at that age. No, I, I only use it for the three-second game or two-second game of that, or one pass in each zone. I use it for those games. So if they hear the duck call, uh, they know the other team gets the puck. So how are you blowing it all the time on my team if you – <laughs> if you had to pass, they pass until they get to the about outside the other team's blue line, and then the blinders go on, and there is no passing after that. Yeah, I'm witnessing that at that age level. You 13 girls, there is no passing. Uh, they make passes, but they're not like they don't see the ice ahead of you and throw it ahead. They they might go laterally. A lot of deliberate passing, but Sammy, go ahead. I wanted to hear more from Tim about uh, change on the back check because I'm kind of, I do see it a lot at the NHL level and it seems like if you're gas coming back and you can get the other player jumping a full bench ahead, it seems like it would be an advantage, no? So I'm kind of curious your thoughts. You seemed very adamant about being against it. It, it can be in situations, and if you're careful about it, but it leaves the door wide, especially in today's game, when defensemen are always in the rush, it always leaves a 1,000, 2,000 for me, giving the other team an opening. You know, it doesn't happen a lot, but I, I you know, I, like I said, situationally, it can be useful the most useful is if, say, you've got a three-on-two, you're near the end of your shift, so you want the players to take that extra attack. And and then if it's safe, obviously make the change on the back check. But I actively discourage it because it leads to more problems than not for me. I mean, it's just I my... I think that my, the only safe one really would be that last forward. The last forward back out of the zone. Yeah, but you don't, that's not what you see in the NHL. Right. You just see them randomly, hey, you know, I'm tired now, I'm getting off. I, I'm sort of flabbergasted. But, you know, the other the other thing with the NHL guys is most of them are acutely aware of the situation in the environment, and they get away with it a lot more because they know, hey, it's a, it's a pretty safe two-on-two -two going ahead, and I can sneak off and sneak somebody back. So they're really intelligent. You know, at all other levels, you don't really see that intelligence. But I, I just think it's a bad habit. And, you know, it's way more effective to try to look for chances to either change on the on the attack or, to Wally's point, I really think that, that teams, you know, possession change is really important three-on-three. Three. It's really important four-on-four. Four. And... It should be equally as important five on five situationally. Again, if you're, you know, you have the sense that you need a change, you're not under a lot of pressure. If you can hold on to the puck and get a couple of fresh bodies on, um, I think 
you know, there can be more encouragement of that as well. But yeah, never been a back check jeans guy. Uh, the the change idea. Uh, I'm working at U13. Tom is working at U13. Um, I'm just curious about problems you've all had to deal with over the years with changes and how you've dealt with them. Uh, I initially started this conversation, Sammy, because at the U13 level, the uh, the coaching staff had a policy of when the puck's near that the player had to wait till the player went on. Near the bench. Near the bench. And I have no issues with that. It's just, boy, oh boy, there's sort of a reflexive moment there of decision making. And the simple way to me is get out of the way, let them get on. If it hits your feet, okay, you pay the price. But the, the reaction of coaches to the 22nd shift, which is absolutely too short, yelling at the kids, and then being upset about the fact they're not grabbing that concept of normally we let the player out, then we come off. We don't grab the door. And I think whatever policy you deliver on, it's the yelling at them after that can really, you know, have a, a negative influence on their performance. So that. Well, I have one comment on that, Wally, in that um, I don't know if uh, you guys watch too much sledge hockey, but in sledge hockey, they change out of the same door. So less about shift length, but more about just as a coach and as the manage, like you have to manage your bench in such a different way because you are the eyes. And you're the only one seeing who's coming in. And, you know, there generally there's uh, glass that you can kind of see through as the sledge hockey guys are sitting there, but they're sitting in a row of defense and forwards at that door, ready to go out that door while everybody's coming in over here. So um, it'd be interesting to get the take on sort of sledge hockey coaches management, how to do that. But since I've seen that, I now incorporate that with my adult rec women's team because the uh, benches are so far apart in the arena. So we all change, people come into one door and then uh, DN forwards are going out the same door so the women don't have to skate as far to get to the other end um, if it happens to be in our defensive zone. So it seems to work really well going out that. So I don't know if anybody has ever done that in um, rinks where the, the, especially European ones where there seem to be almost in the defensive zones. Has anybody ever done that? Yes, I, I I have. It hasn't necessarily been come in one door, go out the other. Uh, but what happened, and Tim, this relates to your story. When I watched the U of C team, your girls team in a preseason, when you were watching with Danielle and I was watching up top, and I, uh, the veteran players were on the bench coaching, you know, opening and closing the door, really. And I said the four check was perfect. And they just naturally figured it out and they had width and depth. And I said, I said to Tim and Danielle, well, when you start coaching it, they'll screw it up because here they were doing it perfect. My question, Tim, was were they changing by right wing, left wing and the tryouts like that or are they? Go out the door and read the play and get in the situation. Were they playing positionless hockey? Well, they weren't. They weren't playing positionless hockey. Um, I mean, we we never told them to do that, and I don't honestly remember, um, you know, whether you know, kind of was like, you know, if the center came off, just the one close to the door went out. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't re remember. But I, like I said, I would never encourage the teams to do that. You know, kind of to Sammy's point, um, obviously there's less at stake in, in a over 40 women's league game. <laughs> so you can maybe, you can maybe have- I the, don't know that there's less at stake, but- Yeah, yeah that's great, good point, good point. Um, uh, pride, pride hurts, right? Well, you still get to have the mimosas at the end of the game. You're yeah. okay. Um, so there, there's not as much at stake if everybody's going out the offensive door, so to speak, and everybody's coming in the defensive door. 
not as much at stake. Like if the defensemen give up the 30 feet of ice, you know, going out the door, uh, you know, that's always the reason for having the D at this end, the forwards at this end, you know, forwards at the offensive end. So when they change, they're already closer to the offensive end. Like th that's always been the standard, of course. Uh, and I've never done anything other than that myself. Tim, I, I'm going to, uh, I, I really think when you were skating at our Chinook, Chinook camps with pros, and Sammy, this is why I brought it up. The defense, they didn't change in terms of whether they right or left. They just changed. The next guy came off, they went on because the other guy was wherever he was. And the same with the forwards. We had assigned the lines and it, we had the lines up with the colors uh, of them, uh, you know, red team and a white team. And the, whenever we scrimmaged or played games, which was at least 30 minutes of the ice time, they changed themselves positionlessly and they played positionlessly. And I believe if we're talking about where's the game going, what, and, and I don't know, Tim, but the next tryout, I'm going to ask Carla, let them run the bench and see if they positionless change because they were playing a better four check and great D zone cover without thinking about waiting for the winger. So I'm wondering whether the game is actually evolving to that. And at a face off, you'll know what position you are. And, and you might get a line straight at that time because they're all going to be coming off and off relatively similarly. But I don't know, that seems like a, it seems like an important futuristic point anyway. Anybody else got anything on changes? Okay. Now I'm, I've got a, ask a question here. This is for next week's guest. Uh, I'm going to just ask all of you to share questions that you have about challenges as a coach with your goalies. Um, 1A, 1B, alternating, uh, big game playoffs, what do you do now, Tom? You've got one goalie, so you're stuck. But how, <laughs> can you hear me? You dealt with your goalies over the course of the season. Have you? When do you pull a goalie? Do you pull a goalie? If they're hot, do they stay in? What What are some of your philosophies and experiences? Can you hear me? Anybody? Rick, I'm sure you've experienced the whole thing over many years in hell as well. And Tom, you've worked at every level imaginable. Go ahead, Rick. Your speaker, Rick. I've been away for a while. I need retraining here. I think every goalie situation is somewhat unique, depending on the mix that you have um, and what level, what age level and what competitive level you're coaching at. Uh, the, the idea of a 1A, 1B again, uh, if you're at a, at a certain age level, a certain comp competitive level, you've got to kind of balance the scale there, give, uh, give both to perform um, at the more competitive levels I've always had it with the understanding that in big game situations must win situations uh, playoffs uh, tournament finals etc um, we're going to go with the guy that gives us or the gal gives us the best opportunity to win um, yeah I don't think there's anything generally that, that I could throw 
you need to do it this way. You have to deal with the situation at hand and the personnel and the personalities that you have at hand. And also factoring in how your team plays with one or the other in the net. I think Calgary's dealing with that right now. Rick, I've got a question here. Because I think earlier you talked about the max and uh, where you went with the hot goalie with success. At what age would you do that? Because I know a peewee coach had tried that uh, in the provincial finals, I think it was, and he went back to back. He had alternated all year, but went back to back in that final playoffs, and he didn't get his job back. Now, whether that's too young an age to do it at, or whether you communicate properly with the parents and the players that this is my po philosophy. So is that philosophy of big game, best goalie at the time, what age level do you do that at? Uh, you know, that's a difficult question, Wally, quite honest with you. Um, the incident that you referred to was at mid AAA. These are young men that are needing to understand the ways of the world and what it's going to be like if they choose to move on. So it's all part of the training as far as I'm concerned. What you need to expect, what you need to be ready to deal with. Um, I think I, I know of the situation you refer to. Again, not knowing all the details makes it difficult to comment uh, uh, intelligently, I think. But uh, for me, it would be having that dialogue from day one through the final event that this this is going to be, it may come to pass that this is what's going to happen. Um, if you don't get your job back, I guess that's one of the pitfalls of coaching uh, at, at any level, paid or unpaid. Um, you have to go with your gut. You have to go with what you feel is right. You have to go with uh, what you feel is best for the team. But it all has to happen in the concept in the context of a full dialogue from day one through the, through the end uh, there's no secrets here fellas or girls as the case may be we're going to run into these situations and here's how we would plan to deal with them so don't be surprised when it happens related to and, and let me just add one thing wally before you go there i had that discussion with the parent groups as well yeah i think that's paramount at those levels and you had those discussions with at, at any age with the teams you've coached correct absolutely yeah well and let's I say i learned i learned in the early years that you need to have those it was a bit of a learning curve for me but once i established that as a way to go forward i've been very consistent with that at all levels and all genders well i i don't want to get off topic because i still want to stay on the goaltending thing in preparation for next week's guest but last night i found out uh wes wes's team well wes is the coach of the team white uh, u13 tom coaches team red girls hockey but wes has a son playing midget one hockey and last night at practice i'm talking to wes at the bench while jordan's running the practice and i knew his son had played in the so uh, was texting me about his son yeah. being at a game. Uh, no, the the the. Uh, wear off a little bit. Anyway, Wes said his son never got on the ice for a power play or a penalty kill, and Wes is a roll of them just like Tom. The lineup's going at U13. Now this is, you know, midget one U18. And the idea of, you know, doubling a goalie but not playing a player, um, he was upset. And I think it's really the demise of a successful coach because if they <clears throat> isolate a kid like that and he's not good enough to play those situations, I don't know that the outcome matters as much as giving him the opportunity uh, they don't get an opportunity to develop to earn the role. So I just wanted to add that. And I think it's the biggest problem in minor hockey, double shifting at 
U13 is ha uh, happening. And I think as a role as mentors that we have, I think it's incumbent on us to address that. And I, it relates to the mission statement exercise in terms of how you're trying to build a team in terms of functioning. Now, the, the goaltender issues, some of the other things, are there any other scenarios? Uh, I have a discomfort with goalie coaches working with goalies, and they're sort of the goalie is a lone wolf off to the side being coached by a goalie coach, and their goalies are ignored at practices. They just do the drills. There's no time spent of thinking about the drill and making a goalie useful. Um, any issues with goalie communication, uh, goalie coach communication? Anybody have any experiences there, or they just let them go out and do what they want? And is there any dialogue? Yeah. Well, Wally, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. yeah, I just picked up my poor daughter here, just had six teeth pulled out. So, oh, we're sitting in the car waiting for some painkillers to come. But, anyways, like when I coached my son, we had two goalies and we rolled them and you know, it didn't matter what, and we won a couple of provincial championships and all that kind of stuff. When I coached college, I would go with the number one goalie if it was a definite number one goalie, and usually was. And I talked to the the other goalie, you know, about the situation. So, you know, and with the, my team right now, I really don't have any choice because I got one five foot goalie. The only problem was the first two weeks of the season they went on vacation. So, <laughs> but anyways. So it depends on the level, I think. Go ahead, Al. Oh, your mic. You know, I chuckle about the vacation because one of my goalies <clears throat> went to the Bahamas over the Christmas holidays <clears throat> and missed five games. I have two fortunate. It's the first time I've had two goalies in many years um and i just roll them this is u14b and they just alternate but you know uh, and they don't seem to mind if they don't play and uh, but in terms of practice i always talk to them about what what do you need what do you need today what would you like to see because we'll run some drills just for you um we have goalie coaches that come up periodically that are hired by the program and i will ask the goalie coach what would you like to see you want to run you want me to run any particular drills to work for the goal on the goalies and they go they typically say no they just they just watch uh, one year in high school i had four goalies which I went from one to four and at the end of the regular season, they were statistically identical. <laughs> and I had to just go with my gut and pick a kid, you know, one of the kids that I thought was playing better at the end. And, um, you know, th that's the way. It, that, and after that season, two of them left the program and went elsewhere. One of them actually ended up at Mercyhurst playing. Playing, uh, playing for them for a few years. So I don't, I, goalie is a problem in our world because um, most teams only have one. And in, that, in, the, in the youth programs and a lot of the high schools, I know our high school, uh, they play one goalie on the boys team and they have another one who's not very good. And they have one on the girls team and the backup goalie has not played this year and they're out trying to recruit another goalie back to the program because I don't think they want the backup to play. I don't know. I mean, I'm not in that, but it's a problem. I think a little bit as kids wanting to play goal. Um, 
So it sounds like you got the same thing up in Canada there too. It's a it's a tough deal. I, I get. I get. We roll our lines, and I want the goalies to roll. But between being sick and being on vacation and doing that kind of stuff, it just kind of works out normally. The other thing I have done this year is I, my, one of my goalies is is a is a girl. She's going to come meet Sammy when you're down here in February. Um, and the other one is a guy. And um, when I'm short a defenseman or two, which I am now, when the guy's not playing goal, he's playing defense. And he's not real good, but he's not real bad. <laughs> so, and he's just happy to help out. So um, I like that. Um, so, you know, back to what Rick said, you know, it just depends on, on, the, on the situation, especially in minor hockey. In high school, one year, I had one goalie. I had one, I had one goalie for four years, and he got hurt. And I asked the team who wants to play. And a third line alternate winger said, I will. Has he ever played goal? And he goes, nope. Um, and um, I said, okay, you got, you got it. And he used the other goalie's equipment, and he, play, he played five games. He had an 81% save percentage. And then the other goalie came back. That goalie ended up playing for UNO for a year and then went out east. The, the backup kid was a junior, and he asked me at the end of the season, what should I do? To help the team next year. I said, you should play goalie on the JV. And he said, okay. And he did that. And he, you know, he's a great young man. And he now is an, an Army Ranger. Um, couldn't get into the SEALs, but he uh, became an Army Ranger. He's a tough kid. And he was not afraid to get in there and play. And, 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 and so, I don't know. It's it, like the longer you do this, I mean, <laughs> Crazy stuff happens along the way, for sure. So that's I, it for me. I got to run. I got to go downtown for a meeting. I, I love these meetings. I'll see you guys next week. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Al. I, I, I have two things, and obviously Sammy's uh, um, got more expertise in this area. And I think we talked about it before, but I think it's really important, especially for um, – well, it's important for any team, really, just to get the cards on the table. One thing we talked about before is having the discussion with your goalies that, you know, they're, and everybody kind of knows this at an older level, but I think it's uh, helpful to put the cards on the table. Like, you know, you know, there's a couple different reasons you might make a goalie change in the middle of a game. One is, of course, if the goalie in your mind is really struggling. We all know that. But there's also the time where uh, you need to shake the team up. Um, you need to sort of wake them up. And, and sometimes, it's not that often, but sometimes you'll make a goalie change uh, to wake the team up. And I think it's important to have that discussion with your goalies uh, at the start of each year or each team you're working with that that can happen on occasion. And I think that sets you up to have a little bit better um, relationship with your goalies if you need to do that at some point that it's a lot easier sell to be able to say hey Sammy this was not about you this is about the momentum in the game and nobody likes to get pulled out of course but so I think I'd be interested to hear in uh, next week uh, hear a discussion around that and um, the uh, what was the other thing Jeez, there's one other thing um, I might have to might have to uh, defer. Hmm, can't remember what the other thought was. I'll, I'll for, and I got to run here in about ten minutes here too. Um, but I'd be interested in hear the uh, a discussion around that next week. Okay, Tim, I just wanted uh, before Hal went off. Um, <clears throat> Dave Butts is the name that Tom knows about. He was the starting goalie at I think University of Michigan. And they had recruited Esposito as a goalie. He ended up playing on defense, Dave Butts did, or maybe forward on that team at that level, which to me 
was amazing. And I, I noticed it because he had his team pictures in the phys ed office where he was in the goalie's outfit, one picture, and the next picture he was in a skater's outfit. So, Yeah, sorry, I just, because I do have to run, I thought of my second thing I'd like to have a discussion about is um, how do you deal with a goalie who pulls herself or himself out of the game? Because I hate that. I understand it on some levels. But for me, it's basically saying to your team, I quit. And you never want to see that. I've only, I only recall seeing it twice in, and it happened last week in, in the gold medal game, the U18 game. And it's really disappointing to see, especially because the Swedish goalie was so fantastic. And she, it was just, I think the whole team was emotionally drained. They just, it's just one of those games. She, you know, she got two tough goals early, one, one kind of bad one early. And, you know, she pulled herself and it sends an awful sign to your team, even though everybody can maybe understand it. Um, so, and, and, you know, I guess the only other time I've seen it, Sammy, honestly, is Charlie did it. Yeah, I, SO Nationals, I think in like 2014. And I was like shocked. I love Charlie. And she's a fantastic person, fantastic goalie. And, and she got over it. Of course, she battled through that. But it's, it's a very unhealthy thing, I think. Um, and uh, we all know the Patrick Waugh story, of course, too, on the, on the other end of things. But uh, anyway, I defer to Sammy. And I do have to run. I, I can quickly minutes. comment before you leave, Tim. I know Rick's been waiting a long time, but I think this would be a great discussion uh, for next week. Um, but I think you're so right. I, but I think those conversations have to have prior. You know, like um, absolutely. Like if, if you're feeling really emotional or you're having a really tough time, like come to me between the first and second. That's what you can say to as a coach. You know, or come to me, or maybe talk to your defenseman. Or you know, there's going to be situations a goalie needs to come out of the net. Uh, they, you know, they could be hyperventilating as a young kid because they're just so emotional. Um, you never want them to pull themselves, but you need to have that conversation at the start of the season before it even becomes an issue. I, it's the same way as a defenseman sitting themselves or a forward sitting themselves. You, you don't want it to happen. You don't want to see it happen. But it's also not the time to get upset in that moment because they are so upset, you know, and uh you know, how do you rectify that the same way you would with any other player that quits on their team? That's the that's the biggest thing. Um, yeah. But anyways, I would love to have that discussion and the discussion about how goalies at the young age group can't be goalies full time. So I think we're now seeing that uh, play out as not many people want to be goalies then later. You can't start technically till you're, you're 10 in this country anymore. So that becomes hard. Yeah. And anyways, I you know just, you have to go. So. Yeah, and I do have to go, but I, and I just had a thought as you were saying, uh, talking there, that it might be useful, like on on the QT, if if you're my goalie, Sammy, if we have this discussion, and, I, and we we agree that, hey, Sammy, if you're really really struggling and you feel like you haven't got it, you want out of the net, whatever, you have a, a secret signal so that you know you're in the net, put your your glove on top of your head or something. Nobody knows, but then there's a signal between the two of you. And so I can make the change and then we can have the discussion afterwards about the pros and cons of doing that and everything else. But that might be a, a useful thing. Uh, we can. I, I would love to talk about it next week as well. Anyway, I do have to run here. Thanks everyone. Good to see you, Sammy. And by the, you, way, by the way, uh, I thought Ren Renata was fabulous on the U18 like another budding broadcaster. Um, she was so good, right? And I think that next time Peter comes on too, you have to tell him that I have bragging rights over him because we beat them twice in Montreal. So actually in Ramouski, so. Uh, okay. <laughs> Try to drag him. I just Zoomed with him the other day, but I, I really enjoyed Renata. She was good. Anyway. Yeah, take she's care. amazing. Yeah, take care. Rick. Oh, you're on mute too, Rick. Thanks, Sammy. Uh, just a couple of things on, on goaltenders in practice. Um, 
over the years, it, it became important to me to have something specific for the goaltenders in every practice session where they would get uh, direct attention if we had a goalie consultant or a goalie coach available, which we did at times and other times we didn't. I would uh, I would take that that role and work with them specifically for 10 to 15 minutes on specific skill sets and not just firing pucks at them at random. Uh, yeah, I see the smile, Sammy. See way too much of that, unfortunately. Um, but also with the goaltenders and with the team as a whole, um, in any drill situation, the goaltenders are, are on notice that they are there to get better themselves, but also to challenge their teammates to get better. If they just stand there and let pucks go by, that doesn't help their team. Same with the shooters and the skaters. Don't just lob pucks at goalies at the end of a, of a drill. Make it game-like. If you practice to play, you, pre you play the way you practice. If you're lazy and in, uh, in practice, that's going to carry forward. Conversely, if you work hard and you work specific in practice, that's going to translate positively into your game as well. Um, so the, on that particular situation, uh, as far as um, I've been known to pull a goaltender when he gets to the bench, get ready, you're going back in. But we just need to have a discussion here for a second. And the guy going out knows he, you're just going in to fill the gap here for a minute. We're going to put this guy right back in, or in, some, in one case, it was a, a female goaltender. Um, and at the extreme end, I had a midget double A team that we were trying to get a program started. We had two adequate goaltenders. Neither one of them were 1A or 1B to start the season, but we worked with them diligently. And uh, we got to the point in the season where things weren't going well. And I suggested to our goaltender coach, we bring our, our forwards and our D in after every shift. We have an opportunity to have a chat with them, not necessarily every shift, but if there's something that needs to be addressed, we can do that. Why don't we do this with our goaltenders and see how that works out? So we had a talk with the two goalies and explained it to them. They were going to work on five-minute shifts. Every five minutes or thereabouts, depending on stoppage in play, they'd switch. If there was anything going on, we'd, we'd talk to the goaltender. You're not doing this. You need to do that. You're missing this part, whatever. And then they'd switch again. And uh, that actually turned out to be quite beneficial. I know it's off the wall, not norm, but it's, again, something you try to see, see what the impact is. Uh, that team had a 3-3-3 win record going, into, uh, going at the end of the season. Um, the league we were playing in was midget double A was was a development league. So their playoff structure was that everybody made playoffs. So all you had to worry about was being at your best at the end of the season. Don't worry about how you're going as long as you're progressing. Um, with that system, we we took the uh, ultimate uh, uh, tournament winner, champion for the year, if you will, to uh, an overtime session in the semifinals. Um, and we and we went into a tournament in Calgary, fairly prominent tournament in the spring. And our first competition was against the city champions. And we again used that goalie rotation system throughout the tournament. And we beat the city champions quite handily in the first game. Uh, it didn't distract from the play at all. It became the norm for our group that we were switching our goaltenders just as if they were forwards or defensemen. So. A little anecdote on how to how to do something a little off the wall and get good positive results from it. Sam, any comments? Um, I'm excited about next week, Sammy, because uh, hopefully you can join us because Jeff Richards, I don't know if you know Jeff, I think he might work on the guy's side with Hockey Canada, but he's been at many multiple uh, camps with national teams. and. Uh, He's the one that we just happened to chat, and I, I'm going to edit this part out for him so he knows where we're coming from. Um, I'm uh, any thoughts on what Rick said in terms of your experience as a goalie and some of those strategies that have been employed with you as a goalie by other coaches? Yeah, Rick, I found that really interesting. Um, I had a uh, goalie coach one time that. Um, uh, Dennis, who was the 2006 goalie coach, uh, Dennis Sprocket, Sprocken, yeah. um, who uh, divided the game into five minutes. Um, and I, I thought that mentally as a goalie, that was a really good way to um, keep yourself in the game 
but also to be able to let go of what just happened. So um, in the first five minutes of every game, there's always that excitement. Um, and in the last minute of every game, there's always that excitement. So then within a five minute game, you get two of those one minute adrenaline rushes, which um, I always found super helpful. Um, but I also found that at the end of that five minutes, I could assess how it went uh, mentally and then kind of park it and then move on to the next five minute game. So while we weren't really switching, it's kind of the same mentality. Now, my only concern with the switches is that the coach on the bench knows about goaltending. Now, it sounds like you had worked with your goalie and so that was um, you knew the goalie and what they were supposed to be doing. That's a huge help. Um, sometimes uh, during games, coaches are reticent to talk to their goalies because they don't know as much as the goalie. And sometimes coaches are over talking to the goaltender when they themselves don't know that much about the position. So goaltending is a different sport, let's be honest, all together. So if you've done your, your, um, your due diligence as a coach to find out, like if I'm going to be coaching the quarterbacks, I'm going to find out, I'm going to figure out what the game is like from the quarterback's perspective. Uh, you know, the plays from the quarterback's perspective, but if you're coaching the defensive line, that's going to be a totally different way of coaching, right? So just coaches being um, aware of sort of those differences, that if you are having those conversations with the goalie and you don't know much about goaltending, it's keeping it high level. All coaches know about um, uh, mental fortitude. They know about how to motivate. Those are some things that coaches can do to really make an impact in a game when you don't know as much about the specific positions. So for instance, um, you know, there's two different types of goalies. Some goalies are make work goalies that are all over the place and are looking like they're working hard all the time, but they're giving up more rebounds. And so there's more shots. And so it looks like they're just, you know, into the game more for a coach that doesn't know goaltending as much. They might think that goalie's doing really well and working really hard. But for somebody that maybe knows goaltending, realizes there's a lot of th things you could do to just kind of calm down the goalie and um, little um, uh, cues that you can have to, you know, keep the puck in your third of the ice or make sure that you're not over pushing or things like that. But you need to know the, the position to be able to be, be able to make those comments. So, um, but it sounds like you, Rick, having worked with your, your goalie, at least knew what to be looking at, what to be focused on. I even find it hard at my U9 level to watch it all. So as one coach, it's difficult to sort of pay attention to what everything is going on. And I think as I was that five minute goalie, I would come off and want some information, but maybe the coach hadn't seen that much or hadn't watched or, um, so it's one more thing to have to look out for as a coach, but it is a really interesting um, tactic. And um, I think it would keep me on my toes as a goalie too. It would um, make the relationship between me and my goalie partner, I think a lot stronger because it's almost as if we were in it together and winning it together um, or losing it together, but at least you're going through it together. So I do like that aspect of it, but. Yeah, I guess that's my my whole diatribe on that. Uh, before, uh, I don't know if Rick wanted to chime in right now, but I had one thing, Sammy, that we might get going on it now, but we might get going on it next week. <laughs> yeah, I do have to leave in five minutes, so let's talk goalies oh. next week. Oh. Okay, and it it's on when you're polled. Uh, not pulled, but pardon me, shootouts. The mm. mentality of shootouts, do you talk to anybody? Do you not talk to anybody? Uh, whatever the case, that's, <coughs> that's something I've been through at Spangler Cups where uh, I did talk to a goalie. I was an assistant coach and it wasn't well. It was not really well received by the other assistant coach. Uh, the head coach didn't mind, but it was more to lighten, lighten the atmosphere than anything else that I thought my sense need to be done. And I don't know that it did that or not. It was probably a distraction. We won the game, and he was brilliant in the shootout. So I just wanted to share that. that well, number. then it probably worked. <laughs> well, you can argue it worked, but Tom, uh, go ahead, uh, Rick, if you've yeah. got Go ahead after Tom, please. Well, I get on that same national championship that I mentioned before that we lost in the last two minutes. 
what happened is in the morning skate, I know I talked to this this one guy that he was a really good player, and I said, Steve's you're really, really effective when you cut for that net and doing a drill. He cuts for the net, hits a rut. He hits our goalie and rips his knee up. And that goalie had played every game. The other goalie hadn't played since mid-November, and now we're in mid-March, right? So he had to play the game, and he hadn't been in the net. And there's a there, so there's a you know Willie had gone with just the one goalie all the time, and there's there's a danger there because you know if you just go with that one goalie, those kind of things happen, right? And uh, he still blames himself for the loss, but uh, you know that goalie does. But I mean, he was in a really tough situation, so there is danger in just going with one all the time. Good point. Rick? I was uh, just going to add to the conversation, uh, as, as Sammy alluded to. Yes, I, I took the time, not a goalie myself, but I took the time to uh, educate myself on the position. So, yes, and if I had a goalie coach, I would defer to him on those scenarios. The, the And, you know, with the mentoring I'm doing nowadays and even in the past, I've noticed most coaches don't know anything about goalies. They're afraid to talk to them. Um, and they don't always have somebody available that can uh, can fill that void for them. So that is something that I think every organization needs to address if you're going to develop kids, young kids in particular. I we think, Rick, to- just on that note before you go on, I think, you know, maybe this is the forum, maybe this is the, the platform. I think that... Um, you did it right and you took the time to to figure it out and to find out i think a lot of coaches nowadays just rely on a goalie coach or they rely on an organization to send their goalies to and they don't take the time um how many people start coaching their kids soccer team and never played soccer but they figure it out and they take the time to learn how to coach and take the levels and um you know i think that that's really important for coaches and I think that it should be part of the coaching more a part of the coaching um, levels and association just on 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 that whole different aspect of the sport that is within our sport so it takes coaches like you that really you know just they're the ones that go and shoot on the goalies so they're the ones that are you know seeing it and seeing it in practice and incorporating it so I think it, it we've gone away from that now in in modern hockey and it's all like uh, drill coaches and goalie coaches and it's all kind of separated in silos as opposed to kind of all being together even if you do have a goalie coach but being part of that conversation with the goalie coach back and forth and I think it's so important so anyways that's just uh, continuing on to I guess go back to what coaches used to do all the time now I I, I wanted to do this very <laughs> Sammy before you leave uh, Perry Wilson is the name of the goalie coach his email and his uh, uh, I'm going to mail it to you but it's short I would love to be involved in a talk about goalies and practice plans you are correct the goalies are not involved when it comes to practice <coughs> I'm a firm believer in goalie rotation of minor hockey to me it has to become a win <coughs> uh, to me it has become a win at all cost community they go for a number one and they play all the meaningful games. The number two plays sparingly and gets the easier games. I believe the coaches want to be more fair. Uh, However, parental pressure has begun to dictate these decisions. It's sad for sure. (coughs) They're late bloomers as there's so much to learn. With expensive specialized uh, expensive specialized training, some goalies are left behind. Let me know when I can be a part of things. I'm doing well. I was with the U22 ladies last summer. Great to see you and looking forward to next week. So I thought that would be a, a good stage setter for next week. And uh, really, I'm glad we did get to talk this much about goaltending because I'll edit this and send it to him. And I'm sure uh, his insights at that level. Uh, and, you know, he is a goalie coach, and his observations are very similar to ours, and it, it's it's really, really neat. Awesome. But, 
I just want to add, uh, uh, Wally, on the goaltending thing that uh, that's uh, changing every five minutes. The, the one person in this in the group that didn't really appreciate that whole concept was the stats keeper. <laughs> Drove them nuts. I thought you were going to say the centerman because it no. also would kind of take some time waiting for the draw as people are changing. But no, we would we would change very quickly because we were nice. we were programmed to do it. So it was just. There was a stoppage in play, out, in. Nice. We'll cool off, we'll chat if necessary. Otherwise, get ready to go in five. But yeah, the, the people keeping the stats weren't overly, overly pleased with that, I can't uh, that imagine. concept. <laughs> anyway, so great to see all you guys. Super. Thanks very much. Take care, Sammy. Well, we got... Three old codgers here. I think I'm the oldest, but uh, a lot of uh, brain trust. <laughs> uh, just to summarize, summarize what we've done, we've gone an hour and 25. And uh, yesterday, Rick, we actually had a face-to-face -face session at Cadence uh, in Calgary. Yeah. It was really neat to sit down with Carla McLeod, Derek Loomer, uh, Mike Kennedy, who works with Ryan Hilderman at P3 Sports, uh, and Tim, just all really experienced people. And uh, Carla offered so much, so many insights from her UFC coaching experience, from the female emotional intelligence side of things, and also her coaching with Czechia. And um, what, how you approach that in terms of how inadequate the support is in terms of finances and planning and trying to do things. So it was a, a great session that we're probably going to do once a month, Rick. And I don't know if you can get out for coffee at Cadence and Boness. Uh, but when, when there is, I'll send you a notice, Rick, and you can sit down with the group and Face to face is really neat. I would, uh, I'd be uh, interested in that, Wally. Absolutely. It's just what what day of the week? That's the only thing that would interfere. Now, with right me. now, it looks like Wednesday is the day that Tim picked. But at a.m. or p.m. A.m. and it's eight thirty uh, in the morning. And I work I work Wednesday mornings. And so what we day do? What we can. We'll we'll get into what we can get into for sure. Okay, I'll let you know when the time happens. So appreciate it. Tom, are you ready for the uh, semifinals of the SO Championships? Oh, I really like the way they played last time. If our goalie plays good, we got a good chance. You know? So it be, uh, should be fun. <clears throat> Tom, do you know if Carla's team is playing in town at 7 o'clock the same evening? I'm not sure. Oh. Yeah, I'll check. I'm going to come to yours and then probably head straight to hers right after. So I might not be able to chat with you after the game. So there's a chance that the uh, state women could be playing at the same time because they're playing the new team in the league, Lakeland College. Yeah. But I don't know whether they're in uh, Lloydminster or if they're in at Winsport. Because okay. they're practicing at the same time as us on Tuesday. Okay. Now you're in rink D. That's the first one in. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, are we? That's what it says on Team Snap. Yeah. Okay. Rick, uh, what's happening in your hockey mentorship world? We're getting a much more uh, positive response this season. There's uh, 20, 20 teams in the group. I've got uh, 13 of them now that are that are working with me in some degree, some more so than others. Yeah. Uh, we've got one uh, one U18 team that's going to provincials. They've they've uh, asked me to be a full time participant or as close to it as possible to help them round out their preparation and they want to do well in that. They're hosting so. Uh, you know, they've got an end goal that they want to work with. Um, but yeah, I'm working with groups from uh, U11 up. And 
it's a voluntary thing. It's not mandated, and that's that's the that's the issue is getting them to accept that uh, somebody can help you out without uh, you know pointing fingers and making you feel badly about what you're doing. A lot of them are new coaches, so they they need as much help as they can garner. Um, some of the more experienced fellows, as always, feel that they've got it all figured out anyways, and that's fine with me. But now it's going much better than uh, than last season. I got a question, Rick. Uh, when we mentored back in the day with P3, mm -hmm. it was a paid thing and a, a mandated thing. Yeah. Uh, is yours a paid thing? It is. And when you say it's not mandated, how do you <clears throat> get your foot in the door in terms of respect, trust, and being able to mentor? Because to be invited to the U18 is really a tribute to your ability <coughs> to communicate, gain the trust and respect for them to ask you to become more involved. Well, in, in full disclosure there, the fellow that's the head coach is a, a kid that I coached since he was five, uh, right through his, uh, his Bantam years. Um, and he has also coached with me as an assistant coach for three years. Um, Interestingly enough, on that subject of gaining the trust, it's the assistant coaches that you need to also take into account. I've had a, I've had a situation where uh, I was invited in by a head coach, and uh, as soon as I got involved, the assistants went and stood in a corner by themselves, and one of them actually told me he didn't believe what I was telling him. So part and parcel of what you deal with. Um, but yeah, as, how it works is uh, I'm introduced by their coaching and, and development director. Uh, then I make an introductory uh, presentation via email and invite them. Um, I, I'm free to go and observe practices and or games and then meet casually with them after, just introduce myself. Um, and that, that process has worked. It's, it's, a, it's not a here I am, pay attention to what I'm doing. I will. I am interested enough to be here. If uh, if there's anything I can help you with or any questions you have, feel free to ask. Uh, you have my email. You have my phone number. Give me a call. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, after the holiday season, uh, things went quiet for about three weeks uh, through Christmas, New Year's, and uh, I had a couple of fellows uh, reach out and say, I'd "Like you to come to a practice with me." So it's a process. It takes time. I'm just writing that down. The fact they've asked you, that's trust. That's amazing. Because I, I, I don't think I've reached that stage yet. You know, with anybody. I've, I've gone out, been invited out. Uh, but uh, this year, <clears throat> it's... With Tom, like it's like we're just friends. We talk all the time. <coughs> I did the mission statement exercise for Tom, and I've got a copy of it that I really believe it's it sort of kept the team together of parents and provided a lot more support. And what I did, Rick, is I did the exercise with the parents while Tom was running practice. Mm-hmm. And then Tom talked to me after he and his son came up and the parents actually were asked to create a group that would write it. And and they did. <clears throat> I just received it yesterday or day before yesterday and shared it with Tom. But that was huge because um, standing in the stands watching Tom's team play to qualify for the semifinal. I sat with the uh, sat with the parents, or I was standing, <laughs> and uh, the atmosphere was totally uh, positive, energetic. They were coaching in the stands and cheering and uh, repeating. <laughs> Tom's video had done a video on uh, uh, forecheck, and as well attack triangle. And they were shouting cue words from the stands from miles away that the 
kids couldn't hear, but it's just the idea of him sending that video out um, the, the beginning of the season at that age, you 13. Um, before that, all of the parents coached. This year, there's no parent coaches. Now, Wes's team is a parent, all parent coaches, U13. But Tom's staff is Cassie Campbell and his son. And they didn't need coaches. And there was quite a resentment. So Tom has uh, coaches to look after the doors. And they're involved that way. But it's a much better climate for him. And uh, I'm going to mention this to you, Rick. Parent versus non-parent coaches. What's your take? It is it good or bad? At what point do you allow it or not allow it? I don't have. I don't believe I have a fixed uh, uh, philosophy on that, Wally. Um, Dependent upon the competitive level at midget, AAA, even AA hockey, I don't believe that parent coaches are. Uh, necessarily a positive. Um, certainly below that level, it's hard to get volunteers for to to work with kids that aren't their own. For instance, I, I got involved as a coach simply because I'm at the rink all the time anyways with the boys. I may as well be doing something as just watching. And that's what got me started. Um, but in the, in the event that I have uh, parent coaches involved, uh, part of my process when I'm coaching is that uh, we have a an understanding going in before we ever ever do anything as a team that uh, everybody has input but uh, somebody has to make ultimate decisions it's going to be me as a head coach um, and if you can't be on side with that if you can't put your ego aside then you're not the parent coach that I need involved with this group and I just ask them to step out Have you encountered again, that? Again, you have to be upfront about it and you have to have the discussion. Have you ever had to turn coaches away? I like, have. Okay. Mid-season in one case. <coughs> okay. Well, Jim, I'll give you a little background on, on what Wally was saying is they their backs were up, some of the parents. <coughs> But they wanted to coach and I didn't know any of these people right and so I'd said a thing well you know if uh, we're short because three is all we don't need there's only 15 skaters on the team but if you know short I you know I asked somebody and they got together and sent me a letter saying well we need two weeks notice if you need somebody well I mean I need somebody because like sometime my son says the client just came in I can't come to practice you know and uh, so anyways, that showed how their backs were up, right? Yeah. And then, and there was six or seven of them wanted to coach. And, and Wally came in and did that. And before that, they hardly even, they resented. You could tell there was a resentment when you'd walk around the rink. And after Wally did his exercise, it was a, you know, 180 degree turn and they were positive. And... I was putting different parents on the bench and then I got things saying, oh, they have to be registered with your team and all this, blah, blah, for insurance and all this. So there's two parents that come on and they'll open the gates, you know, one the Ford and one the D. And I had one of them come on the ice with me. Uh, neither Jim or Cassie could come and get to practice. But it, but it's worked out really nice now. And what what Wally talked about is, I was teaching the team play and I thought, you know, I know these, there's so many different ways to forecheck, right? And different views of how you play in your end, et cetera. So I made five minute videos are not great because I'm mm -hmm. holding my camera in one hand and moving the <laughs> objects and sometimes I'm all over the place. But, uh, but I sent them to the parents and I said, can you go over your, with your, with your girl, these things. And that's what Wally was talking about. And they seem to like it. And I think, you know, I think they think I'm showing them some respect because I, you know, 
pass the stuff through them. And so it's been really good ever since we did that. And then Wally, have you got that sticker, Wally? Yeah. Yeah. The magnetic card with the mission statement? Yeah, missions, mission statement. They put it on a magnetic <coughs> card. And it's a different point. So if you got it, I got one on my fridge. I, 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 I was had it in my pocket, and I don't know where the hell it is. But I've emailed it to myself. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I'll tell you, last night, Tom, uh, I'm watching practice. Jordan's team's running the practice. Oh, here it is. Jim heard me. He just got there. Yeah. You see it? Yeah. Now, I'm going to read, uh, see if I can blow this up to read it. Uh, a little higher, Tom. Rick, you're, yeah, I'll, I'll read Better? it to, to you. It's a little blurred. Just pull it back a little bit. Here, I'll read it oh, to there you. There you go. Yeah. Promote the pursuit of excellence through hard work, determination, integrity, ongoing skill development, and friendship. Okay. Now, everybody it's has good, a mission statement. It's a magnetic thing. Yeah. Now, what I told Paulette, who's the manager of mm. the other team, <coughs> I told her two months ago, I should do this exercise with your team. Now, it's all parent coaches. They all... You know, with five parent coaches, you've got support of all the parents, and they all get along, and there's a transition to where there's going to be no parent coaches. And I think I realized that this statement in terms of what you want to do as a coach, if you read it, and I told her, if you read that statement, it means everything's going well if you're doing things the right way. But if you're shortening the bench, if you're yelling at kids, <clears throat> um, <coughs> if you're not working hard, if you're not working on skills and you're not respecting your relationship or friendships, it has to be addressed. In other words, good coaches do things the right way. Yet coaches don't understand what the right way is. So this holds coaches accountable to what the parents want, because what parent wouldn't want that? Even for the best players, it's pursuit of excellence. And how they do it is with the words that are after that. It's, it's the way to go. So I've found, Rick, you deliver it through a code of conduct. And I think the way to complement this, and I mentioned to uh, next year, there's going to be three U13 girls team, all volunteer coaches next year, I'm sure. Because, Tom, you probably won't go back. It's not serious enough for you. No, you well, could. I, I, I'd like to coach a little older so I can do more stuff that. Yeah, but. You're, you're coaching an age of parent coaches are okay, but they don't know how to coach. So <laughs> all I'm saying is doing this exercise gets the parents to understand this exercise. They're, they're going to now move to Bantam AAA. This exercise has got to be walked by the coach and the parents. So they have a right. They have a proper perspective moving forward, and I, I believe, Rick, if this exercise is done by a professional like myself and other people, they could deliver it during a practice because the parents are there anyway. No interference of time. A whole practice, you get a good hour and a half to talk about it and create it. And they write it. it. The coaches can play with it. A coaching clinic <coughs> try to do it. But they're too busy with practices. But this is the buffer factor to help the communication between the parents and coaches in terms of the way they're doing things the right way. So anyway, I'm pretty 
that's what I've learned this year, Rick, because I know you and I talk. You can do a code of conduct. Obviously, <clears throat> who else can that you know? <clears throat> you know, have you got any coaches in mind that you think deliver on it? You've got a good environment and no problems. People that I've coached with, yeah. uh, one of them, my own son, is is he follows that. Uh, he's got his own nuances to it, but he, he's pretty pretty firm with what he does and, and what he and how he does it um but a key for me wally and tom is like when i got engaged this year to do the mentoring out there was in november they've already been on the ice for four to six weeks they've already had their parent meeting and they've missed the opportunity to instill a code of conduct an understanding of how things what our objectives are, how we're going to go about it, what are the what are the ground rules of the game, and so on and so forth. They've already had five, six weeks or whatever of conflict within the parent group, conflict within the coaching staff. I did I did one team last year that invited me in on a more regular basis. And they he had five parents on his bench, and and he selected those parents on the basis of these guys are going to cause me a problem, so I'm going to keep them close at hand. Well, all that did was bring it down to ice level, and he didn't have the discussion with them as to why you're here, what do you think, what's your philosophy? We've got to come to some common understanding here, and a way to move forward as a group, not as a group of individuals. <coughs> and again, I've seen that in this in this year. But ideally, I'd like to get it where. You're selected as the coach. I'll be involved with you from that point forward uh, to help you with your parent meeting and help you get things off the ground in, in on a solid footing. And then we'll deal with things as they come up. Does that make sense? It does, Rick. And I, I'm going to uh, I'm going to suggest <coughs> the code of conduct, which only you can obviously deliver. Be, because you're a professional at it, but it's it comes from you. It's my way or the highway. There is an element of that for sure. This mission statement exercise, it's our way. And I can see that. And that's the difference. So if, if the coaches can't do the code of conduct, <laughs> and it is complex, it requires a real professional mentality. I believe this done with the parents and then they hold the coaches accountable that don't do it. And they recruit good parents to get on the board. I, you know what I'm saying? I've never really thought of this <coughs> before, but when I saw Tom's parents you know, they walked away from me. They turned their back on Tom. And I, I realized, holy cow, volunteer coaches. And uh, Tom, next year, Kyle Wanvig, who's the coach director, yeah, is going to coach a U13 girls team. So he's a parent. His daughter's on the team. Yeah. And, and uh, Wes has coached like, most of my girls already before, right? Yep. Yeah. And Wes said, what about the draft? They're going to draft the players next year somehow. Yeah. And I said, well, in my mind. Well, he's coaching you 11, so he should know the players. He knows the players, but he's got to pick his kid first. Because he, oh, yeah. <laughs> he's driving his kid. So regardless of where she ranks, his kid's going to be with him. Yeah. So he foregoes the first pick other than his kid. And I think that, <coughs> and you know what, you 13. Hopefully this kid's good. Yeah. Well, I'm pretty sure she'd have some genes that would, you know, and it doesn't matter. If you're a good parent coach and you fulfill the mission statement exercise, the support for the technical, it it comes from <coughs> Rick. Your, most of your work is related to the technical, is it not? 
I'm sorry, run that by me again, Wally. Well, I'm saying I talk about behavioral coaching, which is the mission statement exercise and integrity and consistency. But most of your mentorship work would be technical teaching systems, competitiveness, dealing with behaviors, how to create the good culture. That would be that would be accurate. Yeah. Yeah. So something that head coaches are responsible for, you are supporting them for. You're giving them the tools for X's and O's and the culture of the team. OK, I, I can go along with that. It's not it's not that much X's and O's, to be honest with you. I'm not a big X and O's guy. I'm more of a concept guy. But um, yeah, te theoretically or pr in practical terms, you're right. When you say uh, concept guy, what do you mean? I'm not uh, I'm not huge on structure outside of the defensive zone. Um, I, I like to teach the attack options. I like to teach uh, the, the support concept. Um, the idea of puck protection, of read and react, old school stuff. In fact, I'm actually using, uh, you remember the old goal series? Yeah. I'm using both those as a basis for uh, a lot of the stuff that I'm, I'm putting out there. Because I, I send weekly submissions to all the coaches with just some thoughts and some things you may or may not want to use or incorporate in what you're doing. A little bit of uh, background suggestion. <coughs> Excuse me. So, as far as power play goes, I, I'm not keen on uh, on teaching uh, the umbrella or a one three one or whatever you want to put. It's it's about puck movement and and foot movement, keeping the uh, keeping the penalty kill off off uh, off balance by. Uh, keeping the puck moving in the zone, causing them to make decisions, causing them to make mistakes, and then exploiting them when you see them. See, to me, Rick, that's X's and O's because that. Uh, yeah, I don't consider that X's and O's because to me, X's and O's says you you need to be here and you need to do it this way. No, no, X's and O's for us is how do you play in your zone? <coughs> What's the picture on the power play and the necessary? movement and puck skills how do you work on those and improve those and teach those well and that's the oh, other part of what i'm doing uh, wally is uh the details of the game how to properly execute a pass how to properly execute a reception yeah. not just throw it out there and hope he can find it somehow and grab it the difference between a shot and a pass or a clearing attempt yeah uh, Working with a purpose. What do you intend to do here? Why are you intending to do it? What caused you to make that decision? And then make it work. Yep. That's well, that's I, the things. I'll give you an, an illustration. Not, not to cut you off, but I, I uh, the one team I'm working with full time now. He, he sent me his practice plan for last night. I sent him back some suggestions for emphasis. This is a U18 team. Uh, he's a parent coach. He uh, and I asked him, you know, if if this, uh, if you mind me doing this, just let me know and I'll back away. I don't want to be too forceful here. He came right back to me and said, I don't mind in the least. And I showed what you did, said to my son. And the son's response was, that guy doesn't miss anything. They they don't understand the, the, the minute details of the game. Uh, and and they're receptive to it. Like I was on the ice with them on Monday night and they were very receptive to the point where virtually every player came over and gave me a fist pump after. Yep. Well, Rick, that's why I, I <coughs> want to why when I use the term X's and O's, on the other side, I call it behavioral coaching. You're doing the X's and O's perfectly. <coughs> it's not telling, it's the art of coaching and developing independent thinkers on the ice, but also the teaching of the skills. I'm talking about behavioral coaching in terms of what's acceptable behavior. And your story years ago when you didn't want the players driving 
is an example of behavioral yeah. coaching. Yeah. Trust and respect of a rule. Shift length and the purpose of that rule. Disrespectful behavior, a bad penalty. I call that, that side of it is behavioral coaching, which influences, if you do that right, mm. and you do X's and O's, you get fist bumps. But if you don't do the behavioral properly, <laughs> trouble shifting the best players. If you're letting the best players be the power play and they do score occasionally, and you have a turmoil within the culture, you need both. So that's why the Code of Conduct mission statement deals with the cultural side of coaching. And that's when you read it and you look at it. I don't like dealing with X's and O's. But with Kerry Bracco's son's AAA team, I talked to their assistant coach who's a friend about behavioral coaching. I think they addressed it. <coughs> they were sitting some kids and not others for similar bad behaviors. The inconsistency, they lost the respect. They got that on track. But then I discover watching the team closely at the, the recent Max Circle K tournament, they have no D zone cover. Their power play, uh, they are my, uh, they've had more goals scored against them with the power play than they've scored for. Now, a good situation. The, their breakout is fly the zone. Now, if your breakouts fly the zone, you don't have D-zone cover. They don't have D-zone cover. And I just watched it. So they're missing on the X's and O's and the behavioral, which they got straight, but they're missing on, which you and I know <coughs> are, you know, they're almost so fundamentally important. But I don't think average coaches are getting that in their coach education. The fundamental parts of the game. What do you deal with? How do you deal with it? So, last night uh, with Wes on the ice, um, they were doing a surfing angling drill, going through the hips, the hands to the puck. <clears throat> and I was talking to Wes as we did the drill, and I explained the center of gravity and the force on the hands freeing the puck so you get it. And and just my conversation was, he says, well, I took a checking clinic and they never taught any of this. That's what I'm saying. And today I'm going to send Wes the video of the St. Louis Blues from five years ago. Stick on puck checking, no more body checking, which is very aggressive sticks on puck, hips. There's no finishing checks. It's checking through the hips. And <laughs> the so he, that's what we're talking about here. Somehow the coaching education programs need to be a little, quite a bit better at teaching those things or teams are going to require mentors like yourself or ourselves, the whole shark group, and I'm just trying to figure out a way that this is more comfortable because people don't know what they don't know. And that's why we have our sharks call. We learn from each other and we're open to learning. And that's what coaches have to do is not be uncomfortable with what they don't know. Be able to ask questions. The fact you've got People asking you questions, allowing you to provide input. That's an art for you to gain their respect and trust. <laughs> so, congratulations. I'm really glad that you've you've reached that that moment. So, well, so Wally, can I get hopefully it's to get here? down to the kids, not the coaches. Yeah. Yeah, I was uh talking to Jim and how much I'd like you to come and do that 
positive <laughs> energy session with the girls and invite any parent that wants to come be part of it. Yeah. Because I, I think that's a fantastic session. <clears throat> yeah, I think that would add value to everything we're talking about. <clears throat> I, I almost think you could cut a practice short because the parents are there. No, I would never, ever, ever cut a practice short. Oh, I know you wouldn't, Tom. No, the parents can stay another half hour. Okay. You All know. right. Because you get I'm, half hour to get out of there too, right? Eh? Yeah. I, I'm good with that. But I'm just saying the fact I, you, you wouldn't do the mission statement exercise with the parents. You wouldn't do it. You don't see value in it, and it takes a lot to <coughs> well, I do see value in it. I'm just not very good at it. No, that's right. And you, and you did it, and you did a great job. Th that's right, but we're, I'm expecting <coughs> like you to deliver that to the parents and players. And I don't think that's realistic because- I've, I've always done a team covenant with my players. That's, that's always been the thing I've done. But it, did you do it with this, with just your players? Well, when I coach, like, I've coached more college than that. <laughs> okay. And well, when I did the, when I did the fire, we did a team covenant as well that the players did. But with, just the players. Not with the parents, right? No, with the parents, no. Okay. <laughs> this is what I'm saying is coaches have to be more of a, be able to understand how they can sell what they're doing in terms of the right way and the values that you permeate. So if, if you can't do that and you know the value of the arm strength with your team, the value of that with your team reinforces doing things the right way, you're going to be more positive. You're not going to yell at kids. You're not going to shorten the bench. <coughs> It is a statement. I think it's a great second step. I never thought of it. The arm strength exercise is a great follow-up after a practice at Actus. You got the big boardroom. You come up. It doesn't take that long. It's a great session. I, I You pick a time and a place because I think if you experiment with that before, well, I'd like to see if Wes and Paulette could come because Paulette is the <coughs> power of the association. Oh, yeah. And trying to get the, educate those coaches of those three teams means that all the parents and players are going to do things the right way. And it'll be pretty hard for <coughs> them to do things the wrong way at Bantam AAA or Midget AAA. And I never knew about the mission statement. And when I coached those levels, the team covenant worked really well. I didn't have problems. You didn't have the same situation because they <coughs> knew it was non-parent coaches, right? So it wasn't kind of like an issue, you know, so it was a different. But the mission statement with this, with this set of parents was a terrific thing. And uh, probably something going forward that I'll do with parents if I well, ever coach again I don't even know if I'm going to ever coach again so when I think of the midget AAA girls that you didn't get the job back for had we done that but you came in midstream yeah but but Wally yeah, it had nothing to do with anything that board was there that didn't even know I just won the silver medal they looked at my gray hair and said you're too old to coach these people. oh no no I know that but when you start a season, I walked in as provincial silver medalist. I took over the team. We went 11, one and two. And I'm in there and they're saying, well, do you think you can work with girls this age? I, said, I just did. Yeah. No, yeah. You, you can't. I, I under, like to me, it, it was shocking. But you're trying to prevent the boards to not understand what you're doing <laughs> in the right way. And I think by getting educated at this U13 level, I, I learned a lesson on the mission statement exercise. 
So yeah. did you. Because those parent coaches, you might not have finished the season. Yeah, you never know. It wouldn't have been as much fun as it is no, now. No, it wouldn't be fun at all. Now it's really fun. You add the arm strength experiment to that, it's a slam dunk. So moving forward, I have one group of parents, and if I can do it with Wes's <laughs> at the end of the year, not that he needs it now, because he got five parents and staff, they all get along, but you know, <clears throat> they don't. Wes has to tippy-toe. It's like Chris said, or uh, Rick said, <clears throat> one of the coaches was yelling at the players because of the change that they were making. He didn't want her to go out until the player came off. And he yelled at her. The manager saw that. <coughs> you got, that's not the mission statement exercise. That had to be addressed. And, and that's just bad technique. You let the player on and then you come off. Yeah, but. The, that's the, the standard so. hockey procedure. Well, it, it, that comes under the X's and O's of coaching, but the yeah. behavioral side is wrong stuff. <coughs> wrong time to yell at a kid and wrong thing to expect of them. And when you yell at them and you read the mission statement exercise, they violated it. So now you got a head coach dealing with two or three other coaches and I'm trying to help one of them walked away at the end of the last game that I was at because I thought I was comfortable enough for them to try asking a question. <coughs> when you're done a game, Tom, have you ever, like I've been in the room with you guys before you guys say anything, I'm suggesting this experiment with girls. What did we do well? We do that every game, Wally. Okay. Every I, single game, that's what we do. Well, when I've I start off with a question, what do you think? Yeah. Well, that, you know, the two questions are what do you do well? What can we do better? And then the coaches chime in. Well, with Rick, uh, pardon me, with Wes's team, I've just gone in and they've, they've done all the talking, all positive. But then one of the coaches, when they, a game they won, he uses the but word. He says, but we have to do this better. And I just thought, oh, my God. It was such a positive atmosphere, and he's going with the but word and an improvement thing. I said, be, be careful. It's an art. At what point would you do that? They, everything was so positive, and the last thing said was, well, we've got to get better at this. So I'm just saying, if they say that, okay. But when you win, you really leave there feeling pretty good. When you lose, find out what you liked, what they liked, what they noticed. And then what do you have to improve on? What do we need to get better at? You haven't put them down. So that's an art. That, that's what I call it. <coughs> so. Anyway, guys, we've gone two hours, which is wonderful. I had no idea what we would do today, but we, next week I'm going to have a, a goalie person on. And if uh, you want to invite anybody else to join in, it, I think it'll be a great session. And I'll send out and edit the portion of this to him. So, Tom, we'll see you Friday at uh, Winsport. Yeah, that should be uh, be interesting. Cassie, won't, Cassie won't be there, eh? No, she's got that hockey day in Canada. No, yeah. she oh, went no. down Southern States first because she works for ESPN. Yeah, she did something, and I then she heads to Owen Sound, <laughs> I guess. And no. Lanny will be there too. Lanny played with us the other day, yeah. and he said he's going there too. That's why. He, his brother always skates with us, and he yeah. comes once in a while. He just want to get in the ice because he's in an alumni game. Yeah. Now, here's a question with Cassie. 
her and her daughter have the mentality that Kathy's the reason you've lost games. When she's not there, you win games. Well, not every time, just recently. No, I know, but you've heard what she's saying, you know, and her daughter said it because she's saying it. She said to me twice, every time I come, they lose. And it's not every time, but I. Uh, well, we went over quite a text thing after the game about it. <coughs> yeah. It's It's got a lot more to do with our goalie letting in softies oh, than not to let in softies than anything, because Cassie's great on the bench, to tell you the truth. Oh, she's a wonderful coach. Really you know, positive, knows the game. But, uh, you, but you do feel bad when, you know, every time you show up in the last six games, they're probably three and three, and, you know, when you show up, we lose. But it's always because some soft goals went in. It has nothing to do with. Oh, yeah. With anything, because Peyton, I mean, she made that one save. The whole net was open on the side. I could see it. I couldn't believe it. And that kid fires and somehow her leg is out there and stopped the puck because they would have tied the game up, eh? So, I mean, she was on. The game before, she let in a, a dribbler from outside the blue line. She went into the butterfly. Somehow it goes between her legs. It wasn't going fast enough to hit the back of the net. Yeah, I, I was there. <laughs> so, I mean... It's the you know the eleven year old kids. It's up and down like a yo yo way. Eh? It was a breakaway, Rick, and this great young player fell down, lost the puck, maybe thirty feet from the net. But the momentum of skating with the puck, it rolled, went between the legs of the goalie into the net. <laughs> it was the most freakish, strangest goal I've ever seen. And uh, and he have... ended up running over the goalie in the process, but or colliding with the goalie. <laughs> anyway, guys, good job. Thank you very much, Rick, for coming on. You added so much to our group tonight. Hey, good seeing you, Rick. Yeah, well, I'm going to be a right more regular now, so that's I'm pretty pleased with that. So, okay, and I'll I'll talk to uh, <coughs> Tim about a day other than. Like Mondays, I prefer Mondays. Yeah, for my the free coffee. days are Thursdays and Friday mornings. Like yeah. Thursdays, well, Friday, Thursdays, Wednesday afternoon. Into this. Tuesday morning's better for me. Yeah. So, don't don't gear it around me. I can, how are I you can make it great. Days, Rick? Sorry? How are you for Tuesdays? No, Monday, Tuesdays are my full days and a half day on Wednesday. And then I'm free. Okay. So don't don't uh, don't don't lose too many uh, too much sleep over figuring that out. <laughs> if I can make it, great. If not, yeah, I'm gonna leave it leave it with Tim. It looks like we've got a Wednesday thing going, and we did it once, and that might <coughs> be the thing they're gonna do. And is that when you're uh, working at the dealership? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, I can I can do what I did before. I come for seventy five minutes, and then. Drive up to Crow Child. It's only ten minutes from there. On Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday. Yeah, I play at Crow Child. Okay. Well, I'd like to get Rick there <laughs> once because uh, the practical value of what he brings, Rick. We got a group that gets going. On, uh, I understand it, but it's all about the NHL, and it's all about international hockey at the world championship level or the CIS level. And I think what you would do is bring a common sense um, point of view to everything we talk about, because it really is common sense. I, I think that particular group wants to talk about that kind of stuff because that's where they're coaching. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. But I, I like the idea of bringing it you know, making everything they talk about practical and a fantastic session uh, awesome. last, last week. Well, we'll see where we can fit in. <clears throat> Excuse okay, me. Okay, guys, gonna shut off my record. <laughs>